Hello everyone and welcome to the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. My name is Roba Abbas and I'm a visiting professor at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society and also a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia. In collaboration with the Director for the Society Policy Engineering Collective, Professor Katina Michael, we are bringing you another session in series three of this unique seminar series with logistical marketing and communication support provided by Cindy Dick, Melissa Waite and Anna Reid. The PIT Colloquium is an opportunity to hear from our global community about the social, regulatory, ethical and other considerations relevant to the design and development as well as the delivery of technology in the public interest. The colloquium is underpinned by the public interest technology philosophy that is intended to draw people together from across disciplines to address global challenges. So PIT at its core requires shared meaning, which is translational. It is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. It is also transdisciplinary while respecting the disciplines. Throughout the series, we'll be hearing from a range of speakers who'll be sharing with us their experiences and expertise. Our guests today are Mr. Patrick Scannell and Associate Professor Rob Nichols. I'll be introducing each of our speakers shortly and they'll deliver their respective presentations, which will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Mr. Martin Perez Camiso. As always, we encourage our live attendees to note your questions in the chat window or indicate that you wish to speak at the conclusion of the respective talks. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this session, Mr. Patrick Scannell. Patrick Scannell has had a 25 year career developing and commercializing innovative technologies. He has led major transformative projects in a variety of technology categories from the early days of the internet to mobile phones, personal computers, the Internet of Things, the cable industry, smart cars and smart grids, as well as next generation platforms like augmented reality and other projects he can't even talk about. He's comfortable and works regularly in a variety of ecosystems from tech startups through to national defense or government environments, among others. Over the last five years, Patrick Scannell has spent the majority of his time looking at the cumulative effects of technology on the human condition and on human cognition specifically. He has also drafted three books targeted at publication through Oxford University Press that examine the co-evolution of cognition and technology over the arc of human evolution. Today, Patrick will be presenting on the great irony of technology, so why technology leaves us feeling worse and what to do about it. Patrick notes that by most objective me measures and for most Americans and indeed the world, this is arguably the best time ever to be alive in the history of our species. So why then are the leading indicators of subjective well-being, for example, stress, unhappiness, prospective optimism, depression, uh, in long-term decline when viewed across the time spans of the last 10, 20 or 50 years for most Americans? So as a result of nearly a decade-long research into the co-evolution of technology and cognition, Patrick Scannell will be sharing some insights today, noting that technology, which is the driver that makes this the best time ever to be alive, is also the main factor eroding subjective well-being. This irony is more than a quirky observation. Patrick believes it is to blame for many of the crises Americans are dealing with, from the epidemic of deaths of despair to rising racial tensions and increasing political polarisation. So since the near future holds a continued dizziness, dizzying acceleration of technology, it's possible that this effect will escalate to unimaginable levels. As such, and in this talk, Patrick will unpack the case and isolate the mechanisms by which technology undermines our feelings, laying the roadmap for revising this undesirable, uh, or these undesirable consequences of technology. Welcome, Patrick, and thank you for joining us today. I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I, I sometimes feel like a lone uh... Uh, traveler in the wilderness, and I'm not quite sure whether I'm working on some of the most important issues facing humanity or just kind of deluded myself. And conversations like this help me uh, kind of self course correct. Uh, and I'll leave it to you all to kind of opine as we go through this. Um, I think you've covered my thesis. Uh, so I'm going to skip over this slide because I've got a lot of slides, but just uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on some of them. The, the key here is 
I'm not just studying this philosophically. I'm studying this as a, as a technologist trying to understand how we can make better technologies. Uh, I also study it as a, as a user of technology and as a father of children. Uh, and so I want us to, to embrace technology in ways that uh, leave you know, our families and uh, the people who come after us better. And then um, importantly, I, I really come to appreciate uh, issues in America about income inequality, racial inequality, uh, and kind of the, the, the challenges facing the American dream. But I think that the challenges we're facing, uh, if we turn them around, give us a path to a new future. So these are some of my motivations. The lens that I'm looking at here is narratives. And that may not make sense right away, but the next couple of slides may connect them to you. Uh, my work studies the, uh, the co-evolution of technology and cognition. And I, uh, my previous book project, uh, it's called The Disruption of Thought. And I create new models of thought. And, and I think it's difficult for humans to navigate an increasingly complex world. But one of the tools that we've developed over the last you know, 50,000 years as a cultural construct is this idea of narrative. It helps us to take this impossibly complex world and distill it down to things that help us make us think that we understand the world. Uh, I put them in two different buckets. The first is the individual narratives that I think you could view as something that are driven by personal motivations. Um, and then what I'll call sociological narratives, other people call social narratives, there's uh, other, other words for it. But I think the best way to look at that is the incentives that are provided to us by the crowd for joining it and, and working collaboratively. So I'm just teeing that up, that that is the lens with which I'm going to approach this topic, narratives. And right now, I think that there's two dominant narratives in America. The world is going to hell. You can call it the collapse narrative. Uh, it's particularly easy these last couple of weeks to, to believe it. Um, you know, I was looking for iodine pills on Amazon the other day, right? I mean, we all have masks all over our house, but even, you know, two years ago, three years ago, this was what was going on in the last couple of presidential elections in America, polarization, uh, melting ice caps, plastic straws. I still haven't been able to figure out plastic straws, um, but, but this is dominant. I see politicians on both sides of the aisle. It's clearly a, a uh, you know, a dynamic of social media, but it's also the traditional media, entertainment content, news. So a lot of people reduce this down to social media manipulation, but I think it's all technology and all the information that we consume. On the other hand, is this other narrative that I that we started with, which is I, I'd argue that this is the best time ever to be alive. Pinker does a great job uh, making this case in his uh, fairly famous TED Talk. And there's a number of other great uh, writers, the Rossling, uh, Rossling family, uh, Hans Rossling wrote a book called Factfulness, uh, Diamandis, Easterbrook, Ridley, a number of folks uh, have, have recited fact after fact litanies of why this is the best time ever to be alive. And frankly, the two schools really talk past each other because I think Pinker would come across more empathetically if he was able to deal with the subjective stuff that I deal with. Uh, but but these are two narratives that I think are, are important to keep in mind. Uh, and so the question is, is which narrative is right and for whom, right? Okay, the black and brown people in America are you know, subjectively bad, but the uh, top 1%, mostly white, they're doing great, right? That's not the story I find. My book takes a deep dive into a number of uh, different socioeconomic uh, slices of America as a subset, not necessarily of the rest of the world, but as the world that I know and am familiar with. I don't claim to make a, a distinction on extrapolating this to the rest of the world, but I do put a few pages in, chapter, in a chapter on this. Um, but in America, both of these narratives are right for most people. There's a few exceptions. So thus, my my statement, the great irony of technology, where most of us are much better off than the people 20, 50, 100 years ago. And I make the statement that even the royals of, say, 300 years ago, uh, really suffered dismal day-to-day -day lives compared to many of the things that we have today. Um, but of course, I think we all feel worse off. So when I make these statements, I, I, I frequently draw a lot of uh, visceral responses, you know, people want to jump in and say, well, how do you define success? And you're not thinking about these people and you're underestimating this, uh, which is why I wrote this book. Uh, I, I made these statements in a couple of pages and a couple of talks and people kept challenging me. So I did all this deep dive. And uh, at the bottom of this is this quote from Ridley, who wrote The Rational Optimist. And he said, in his review of trying to find the right scorecards, 
he finds that economists aren't really good at looking at this issue of how do we define progress and success. So what I did is I used objective things like lifespans, uh, uh, GDP per capita, uh, biological uh, issues that, uh, you know, maybe it's health and, and, and medical, but also cultural benchmarks in terms of hum, uh, human rights and positions in power. Subjective ones we've discussed, happiness, life satisfaction, stress. And then I found, you know, the, there's these hybrids, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm purposely not invoking Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As some of you know, there's certain criticisms of that. Long list of things that I evaluated. So when I look at these issues, the first thing I do is I make this distinction between objective and subjective. The second thing I do is I also add this uh, lens of intrinsic motivations. Uh, Decky and Ryan and De Decky and Harlow had done this work uh, around self-determination theory, which is for someone to feel good about their lives, they generally need one or more of these four things. A sense of personal progress, not necessarily real progress, but a sense of it. Connectedness to others. Autonomy, the ability to kind of control your own destiny and a sense of purpose, being part of something bigger than oneself. So I take these lenses uh, and I look at these different groups. And here's the groups that I, I looked at. Uh, I looked at the extant literature. Uh, I did you know, primary research as well. Uh, but what I was trying to do was capture a multidisciplinary view of how these people uh, feel about their lives. I mean, obviously, middle-aged whites without college degrees. Pat, what are you, racist? Why didn't you start with blacks? But interestingly, the American lifespan metrics have been declining in the last few years, and uh, deaths of despair by Case and Deaton and, and other scholars have attributed that to uh, issues in the American heartland, in the flyover states, and among whites that don't have college degrees. So I started with that because they're having a negative impact on the overall. And then I go into you know, some of the groups that uh, people typically challenge me on, uh, Blacks and particularly Black males because of incarceration rates. I then try to vacillate back to, uh, well, if all those things are, are working against the flourishing of Black adult males on average in the United States, well, what's the opposite? You know, affluent, well-educated youth. And then I went through all these different groups. And you know, I have chapters ranging from 10 to 20 pages on each one of them, ending with a scorecard of those intrinsic motivations. Now, I'm not going to bore you with this uh, long book and the, the appendix, which is each of these chapters by itself is 160 pages, but I'm just going to give you just six or seven takeaways from all this work. The first thing is you can't be a pinker or a Rosling or, or somebody out there shouting to people that this is they're living much better than their parents or their grandparents because people's well-being is first and foremost a subjective uh, outcome. So this, this is why we talk past each other when we tell them, I know your life sucks, but you live the best life ever of any human on the planet. They hate to hear that. Um, but objective resources do scaffold this, and we'll come back to it. We take for granted that uh, I can go to Walmart and buy a pair of jeans for 15 bucks, or I can pick up my phone, press a few buttons, and have a hamburger delivered to my house. But all of these things are the result of change, technological change, economic change, cultural change. And every time something changes, you get lost in America. You have jobs shifting out of America to allow us to have the prices of the jeans that we want to buy. We have people who used to be delivery people who don't have jobs. They've now become DoorDash drivers. Every single thing that changes in America uh, causes a loss to someone. So all the positives that we have are balanced by negatives. Now, if those people taking those negatives are looking forward and they're upskilling themselves, that's great. But otherwise, we miss the fact that all this positive change has a shadow echo of all this loss. And we can talk more about that later. I spent a lot of time dealing with the issues of income inequalities. And, and I know it's not great for people to hear, but the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum is really doing much better, sometimes even growing faster than the middle and high part of the curve. I, I know that at the highest points we have growing disparities, but if you take a step back and you say, well, what has been the income growth, what the educational achievements, et cetera, there's been some significant achievements, particularly if you look at the 20, 50, 100 year kind of arc. Um, there's narrowing of some of these inequalities, including the outside, outsized gains and technology, as much as we see uh, 
blacks being pulled from cars, Asians being hit today uh, on the on the street by whites, and uh, women working not just a third shift but a fourth shift taking over uh, the needs of a graying adult uh, population. You have all these inequalities, but what what we also don't realize is that technology is artificially amplifying these inequalities in a lot of ways. Pat, you can't be saying that about black men. They're getting beaten and shot by cops. But if you look at the historical numbers, the trends are positive. But we all have, now have body cameras, social media, and things can go viral. And the things that tend to go viral don't tell some of the positive stories. So my argument is that these issues are real. They need to be addressed. But uh, to a certain extent, they're not deeply understood in America. And I appreciate the criticism I'll get for that. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say is when we win, we lose. If the idea is we're going to close all these inequalities, we're going to pull people up the ladder, or better yet, not be patronizing, say we're going to pull them up the ladder, but get out of their way and let them climb up the ladder, then we are saying that when they get to the top of the ladder, they'll be happy. But what I found is that in the uh, upper middle class and, and even the true upper class uh, suburbs and enclaves of the United States, you don't find a lot of ha happiness and life satisfaction. Uh, we can get into some of the mechanisms around that, but uh, I'm particularly distraught when I saw some of the well-educated, uh, affluent young teens. These are among the most stressed out members of our society, and they have all these privileges that we're trying to provide for everybody else. If that's the case, what favor are we doing to people if we are blindly closing inequalities and pulling them up and or, and or getting out of their way, letting them climb themselves up, and they feel they're worse off than they were before you stepped in or, or before you got out of their way? America can't be painted with a broad brush. Uh, I hear a lot of my peers and a lot of people talking about rural America, and I'm using terms like black and brown and women. Uh, but I found uh, the, the more you micro segment America, and I've got some methodologies and some stuff we can get into, the better you can understand and break apart and really see the trends. It's really uh, misleading to lump together some of these groups. Uh, one example is Native Americans, very diverse populations, but as a group, this is one of the uh, clear exceptions that I will uh, gladly uh, uh, recognize with uh, the great irony of technology. They're not any better off than they were 20, 50, 100 years ago. Their life sucks. It's among the worst in, in the country, and uh, uh, it's not getting any better. There's also some success stories, and I'm a little bit worried about time, so I'm just going to keep going. I'm really appalled at uh, the state of youth in America. Um, so... I've been blaming technology. How does this happen? So I have a whole chapter on this, and I've reduced it to five out of, say, 12 mechanisms. The first is, is we don't see positive outcomes. You do not see reporters standing in a field saying, I'm reporting to you today from a country that's been at peace for 40 years. We miss, and this is where Rosling's books and others come in, all the good things that happen. Uh, we literally, they don't show up in our, not just social media feeds, but the television we watch and the radio and the newspaper and the conversations we have with other people. Um, what we do attend to, I think we're all pretty aware of this now, it gives us this flawed and negative view of the world. And I'm gonna spend a bunch of slides on this topic of we want the wrong things. Uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that. Technology does allow other people to have an ability to distort our lives. I'm not gonna claim that that's the biggest issue, but it's certainly a big issue. And we saw that in elections and in social media today. Um, and, and I'll get into some smaller things like, you know, we're just overwhelmed. You know, Toffler wrote about uh, future shock, but I mean, just the amount of information and I'm gonna, you know, I make a case in the book that uh, just trying to keep up with technology, you know, your passwords, your Wi-Fi, your signal strength, you know, getting your Roomba to get the hair out of it, reading the, 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 you know, all the things you're supposed to read to keep all this stuff secure, at a certain point, we're just exhausted with all this tech in our lives. But I've also argued that you should look at how technology affects us from a social perspective. And to do that, I think it's important to re recognize we're a pack animal. I mean, we are wired to attend to and try to build status, whether that's for mating, access to food. We have these archaic and anachronistic needs. So when we sit down at a coffee shop, we think we're people watching, but we're trying to figure out who has influence, who doesn't, what can I adopt from what I'm hearing and seeing that can give me more status. I think that that mechanism creates incentives that aren't necessarily good for us, especially since they're anachronistic. We'll spend, we can spend more time in Q&A on that. 
I come down really hard on advertising, not uh, Zuboff and or surveillance capitalism. I know there's good work being done there. Tina does great work leading, uh, leading the thought on Ubervalence. Uber I'm saying all advertising. I believe that all advertising, the model that we've accepted for radio when it first came out, television when it first came out, and everything since then really is a significant contributor to this issue. Um, and I could spend a lot of time on a lot of these, but there are ways that we think cognitive biases that are um, played out kind of in overkill in other places that actually get socialized and create uh, incentives for uh, us to adopt certain cognitive biases just so that we can get along with others. I'd also like to point out that the word paradigms in the Kuhnian sense is a structural uh, construct that's a good thing. A paradigm of shared beliefs, understanding assumptions allows a, a team of, of people to work together within that paradigm. But as we have all this cultural and technological change, we're disrupting those paradigms. We're creating paradigm shifts. And so some people are in the new paradigm, but you're incented to work in the old paradigm. Much of my work would probably use different words, but I have to adopt other words so folks can understand me. Uh, this is just a brief uh, sense of how social narratives uh, of getting along to go along uh, are contributing mechanisms in what I'm looking at. So I don't blame technology. Um, I, I take great offense now to this idea that technology is overwhelming. Uh, it's Moore's law. It's out of our control. And Kevin Kelly and what technology wants is the is the best uh, kind of example of this. He talks about it's how, how it's the seventh uh, domain of life on Earth. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not here to criticize Kelly. I'm here to try and find solutions. And I find the solutions, as you'll see, not by looking at technology, which is almost impossible. I would argue it's impossible for us to change, but by looking deeper. And while I agree with, you know, Tristan Harris and, you know, social dilemma, I think these people are focusing on the wave tops uh, by saying, here's some unethical companies and some things that need to be fixed. Those are the symptoms, but they're not the forcing function. I believe we, our human nature, are the problem. And I think that by understanding it and coming to terms with it, we can then see a pathway to something else. That's probably the most provocative thing I'll have to say in the next few slides. Here's one of the you know, leading uh, economists out of the Austrian School of Economics. I believe Menger, Karl Menger won a Nobel Prize and then he mentored four or five others that did. But he was really unique in economics because he wasn't talking about an invisible hand and, and uh, market activities between you know, uh, manufacturers and consumers. He turned the tables and said that it's human needs that drive an economy. So building on that, and if I want to say, well, what drives technology, if it's not technology driving itself and it's not Moore's law, the gap, uh, Laswell is a political scientist. I, my graduate work was studying under somebody who was mentored by Laswell, a really prominent political scientist. And he defined a uh, problem as a discrepancy between current and projected uh, state of affairs, right? So that's a problem. Plato said necessity is the mother of invention. And so what I'm setting up here is a wheel that says technology is really a set of practices to use resources to solve problems. And so if this is T0, I'm unhappy about my current state of affairs and I develop emerging needs, I then adopt or develop techniques or technologies to meet those. Those develop improved outcomes if they're fruitful and the ones that don't, we stop. And that should lead to a successful T1, time one. But let me break this down for us. Heidegger, too, says technology is a means to an end. It's not growing on its own. It's growing to solve towards a problem. So this set of emerging needs that we have, some stem from biological, I need to eat. Uh, others are culturally induced. I need to get a new pair of pants because everyone laughs at these because they're not tight enough. Advertising influences me. The effects of technology, we talked before about the overload of using technology, numbs us out, which then makes us not seek deep work, but instead seek social things that give us an escape from our overwhelming lives, right? And then you have these artificially induced needs, whether it's the media hyping us up or bad actors. But my point is, is you think you're in control of what you need. And in fact, it's highly mediated. The technology that you adopt is a distraction from the real life. 
uh, Baudrillard and others spent a lot of time talking about the difference between the life that we experience through technology versus the real life. And I write at length on that. Uh, it's not related to reality. And there's this construct that tech is universally good and more is better. By the way, I'm a technology fan, but after doing this work, I see tech completely differently than I did before. We talked before about the positive gains are hard to recognize. There's biases and attending to the bad. And every time we achieve some new gain, we find that we've reset the finish line of what it was that we want. So by the time that the little clipboard is materializing, there's a new little running person created. And perhaps most importantly is even if we do reach that uh, fleeting ephemeral finish line, we become overwhelmed with the technology we just adopted. This accumulating technology disrupts those narratives and paradigms that we use to guide us through and make sense of our world, including cultural constructs. I talked about managing tech, but I didn't talk about squandering the benefits of tech. This isn't, um, where's my flying car? This is my microwave was supposed to give me three minutes. My self-driving car was supposed to give me a few minutes. My Roomba was supposed to give me a few minutes. And the ads for these things show us walking in fields with butterflies. But the reality of adopting technology is we may get some of that time back, but we then squander it by squeezing other things into it. So some meta observations and I'm gonna wrap it up. So looking at this whole cycle here, which turns things on its head, I'm not saying, you don't see me saying that Google's bad here. You don't see me saying the legislators are really bad here. And I'm not saying technology is evil and we, we should all you know burn it. Society develops technology to address the things that are needed within it. Kurlansky uh, is a New York Times writer who wrote a few books on this, and I think he, he articulated it really well. But when you look at this cycle, it's, you're reminded of what's called the hedonic uh, treadmill, Brickman and Campbell, that even getting something new, winning the lottery, doesn't improve your outlook. In fact, going through uh, cancer and surviving, uh, your outlook is more positive often than winning the lottery. But let's take another look at this from a complexity perspective. We're getting more and more complex to solve problems. The more complex it is, the, the more uh, uh, there's a need of more complex needs to driving an increase in complexity. Um, but when you look at complexity sciences, Perot, uh, who wrote Normal Accidents about 30 years ago, a great book, talks about how increasing complexity interconnectedness makes us more vulnerable to, threat, to threats, not less. And he studied Bhopal, well, actually just before, the, the increasing complexity means we're more fragile. By the way, these are different fields. And if you think, I'm, I'm, I'm invoking uh, Heidegger, a philosopher, Laswell, who's a policy analyst, uh, Tainter, who's an art, uh, anthropologist and archaeologist, Perot, who's a sociologist. So going back to this forum, I, I would hope that you're not laughing at me for being multidisciplinary. But Tainter uh, studies Bronze Age collapse and lots of other uh, collapse uh, uh, scenarios and finds that when you have increasing complexity, there's fewer and fewer gains with each innovation. And so as a result, you begin to accelerate that, that to get more complex and you race faster towards consuming all the available resources. And I'm just going to kind of ground this with a couple of basics, right? You know, we used to 20, 30 years ago, our parents would walk in and get coffee with cream. Now it's a triple shot, caramel, blah, 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 right? And DoorDash to you. It used to be a TV, now it's an 80 inch TV. And even by the time you get it installed, you're looking at the 85 inch TV. It used to be a mobile phone with texting. I was playing a pretty prominent role in that industry and I still am. Now we're walking around with uh, the equivalent of the top supercomputers in the world in 1996 and 1997 and even 1998 in our back pocket. And I don't know if it's just me, but I'm getting a lot of ads and maybe I should be worried about this, but I'm getting a lot of ads in the information I consume for uh, bidets and new technologies related to bed bidets. And it used to be toilet paper and toilet paper was good enough. And now we've got flushable wipes and high tech, soft, extra soft toilet paper and bidets and the internet's not good enough, we need the metaverse. So I'm just gonna end with a, a couple of points. I think we're at an inflection point in human history where you know, we grew up in a time of uh, resources were scarce and danger was abundant. We're now in a situation where our biggest threat is deciding what things we choose to, to attend to. We are in control, we have agency. 
We can steer the ship. We don't have to depend on noble uh, elites in Silicon Valley or smart legislators to fix this. But I don't think anybody sees this at writ large. Uh, there's tremendous disincentives to do the work that I do. Uh, first of all, everyone thinks you're crazy, but no one's navigating, no one's steering from the perspective of society. There's some things we've done in the past that are similar that we could look to as models, but the current system doesn't serve us. I don't think the, the complexification gives us the returns that if we took a step back and, and really looked hard at, this isn't a climate change or an environmental. I'm just saying for the purposes of technology serving us, we're putting more and more energy into something and we're getting little lesser and lesser out of it. And I think that this leaves us to existential threats. And I think the pandemic and the war kind of helped to drive that home. Curate the information you attend to on an individual level, begin to focus on these intrinsic goals. Once you become conscious of this, you become really interesting, uh, really interested in the kind of technology that you adopt. Well, I've covered a lot of material so far, and I want to pause as we finish up and just point out that uh, most of this material is not new. What I've really tried to do is stitch together relevant work from a number of other people from a number of other fields. So I thought I'd end with uh, a few insights from some of those folks that I think drive home the points that I've been trying to make over the last uh, 28 minutes or so. So uh, I'm going to start with Kurlansky, who's a New York Times uh, reporter and author of several books. And in one of them, he makes this quote, which I think is really perfect, that, you know, we shouldn't blame technology. What we really should be thinking about if we want to change how technology affects society is that we have to acknowledge that technology exists because society is making a shift and technology thinks it needs that technology. The way to change this isn't, you know, uh, managing the technology itself, but affecting the mechanisms uh, of the changes in society that we want to see that should then result in changes we'd like to see overall. Keynes, the uh, famous economist uh, in 1930 was writing to his children, looking at the, the issue of what happens when we have solved all the problems that are available to us. And this is 1930, right? We've come so far from then. But even at that time, he said, if we solve the economic problem, our purpose will be gone. What what will be the benefit? And more importantly, he worries that for the first time in human humanity's history, the problem will not be how to solve scarcity of food and you know so resolving problems with danger and conflicts and other things, but how to occupy our leisure, how to use science and all these things that we've done and accomplished to live well. Perhaps a little bit more poignantly, Jack Lul, a writer who I really respect, uh, writing in the uh, mid 20th century, um, was a little worried about the work that he had done on uh, looking at the effects of technology on society. And he saw three, only three possible outcomes. One, war, uh, essentially wiping out the gains that we've made. God, you know, some omnipotent force. Or finally, humanity itself. If people can become aware of the situation that we're creating for ourselves, how we live in our self-created uh, environmental or ecological niche, uh, maybe then we can reverse uh, the outcome and assert our freedom to live better lives. Um, so I think these three folks have made the points that I've been trying to make much better and more eloquently than I have. And I really thank you all for your time. And I look forward to discussions of, of this and uh, even critiques. Uh, very much appreciate the time. Oh, <laughs> I thought I'd end on a positive note here. Uh, the last slide is uh, from a country song, you know. If you just go by the nightly news, your faith in mankind will be the first thing you lose. But I believe the world ain't half as bad as it looks. I believe that most people are good. And, and if anything, I want to communicate that, that um, I know we're living in a time in which it feels like we're just constantly being beat down by climate change, pandemic, war. Um, but I think if we take a step back, I think it's still possible to embrace and, and appreciate that this is the best time ever to be alive. And that's because we're surrounded by people and opportunities that are fundamentally good. So I wanted to end on a positive note. I hope you all have a, a good afternoon and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so very much, Patrick. That was great and you're spot on time. It was such a thought-provoking talk and we're certainly looking forward to questions and reflections in a moment 
where we can unpack some of your ideas and delve deep into the insights that you shared. And I certainly appreciated the multidisciplinary underpinnings and lens that highlighted uh, some of the challenges that we're all facing and that we've discussed on several occasions as part of this seminar series. But before we go to questions, I would like to first invite uh, Rob Nichols to deliver his presentation. By way of introduction, Rob Nichols is an Associate Professor in Regulation and Governance at the University of New South Wales Business School in Sydney, Australia. Uh, Rob researches competition law and the regulation of networked industries. And before moving to academia, he had a 30 year career, including working for law firms and for the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Rob is also an accred accredited mediator. Rob will be speaking to us today on the topic of designing and co-designing agents in models of online social networks. And in terms of background to this talk, Rob maintains that the infrastructure created to provide services such as social networks, in the case of Meta or Search, in the case of Alphabet, creates large, complex, adaptive systems, as we heard from Pat a moment ago. Um, such complex, adaptive systems can exhibit emerging emergent phenomena that is outcomes which are different from expected behavior and driven by the interaction of boundedly rational, uh, rational participants. One such phenomenon is potentially the spread of dis and misinformation, and another is the suppression of factual information. Determining the mechanisms of such phenomena in a digital twin can form part of a co-design process as part of public interest technology. And throughout his presentation, Rob will explore the degree of sophistication of an agent that is required to reasonably predict emergent phenomenon in a multi-agent model of an online social network. He will additionally provide an example of the use of co-design of services on social network platforms. Over to you, Rob, and thank you for accepting our invitation to present. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Rova. So it's really great uh, to be here this morning. I'm really honoured to be with you uh, today to talk about the intersection of two areas in which I'm working. Uh, one of those areas, particularly the area of co-design, I'm actually working with both Professor Katina Michael and Dr. Rova Abbas. And, the support they have provided leads into some of the thinking in this presentation. But as ever, all omissions and errors are mine. What I'd like to do today is to start off by setting out my research motivation, and I'll try and locate the work that I'm doing. Actually, though, locating the work is one of the more dis difficult aspects here. The project that I'm working on is transdisciplinary. So locating it in one or more of the traditional uh, areas of expertise, potentially silos, becomes quite problematic. Um, the second issue is that some of the work is supported by an untied gift from Facebook. Well, Facebook, when I did the proposal for the gift and, and Meta now, that part is reasonably simple. Meta is concerned that one of, or more of its social network platforms could exhibit emergent phenomena. I'll try to the, address the rationale for that concern in a moment or two, but you can start to see that there are two potential impacts on Meta. The first is that being able to predict emergence has significant commercial implications to the upside. The second is that an unpredicted emergence of a reputational harming phenomenon could be exceptionally problematic. And this is where that, uh, the issue that Rober mentioned in the introduction becomes problematic. What happens if the emergent phenomenon is the dissemination of mis or disinformation? What happens if that emergent phenomenon actually suppresses information? So I'm gonna do a quick review of complexity and emergence. Pat has mentioned complexity, and sadly, I'm going to be doing a very quick review. All I'm going to do is, all I'm going to do is to demonstrate graphically 
that a simple collection of boundedly rational agents can lead to emergent phenomena if those agents are part of a complex adaptive system. Because I'm introducing weird terms like complex adaptive systems, I'll also try and set out some of the characteristic of such systems. I'm then going to move on to some of the issues with a social network digital twin. That is, how do you build something that models a social network in a purely digital or cyber cyber space? And I'll try and give you an introduction to some of the issues associated with good agents and bad agents. In practice, as I'll talk about a bit later on in the design of models of people, differentiating between good and bad is essentially non-trivial. And the next element that I'll deal with will be discussing designing agents as models of people. Although people are very complex, many decisions made by most people most of the time are based on heuristics. That is, we don't spend much time in deep thinking about simple decisions or indeed most decisions. Nothing is very new, new in this concept, and uh, Pat's already cited Kahneman, and Kahneman's uh, thinking fast and slow gives you a very good introduction to this. But it does have significant implications if the objective is to be able to predict emergent phenomena. Finally, I'm going to look at a couple of issues associated with co-designing agents. Now, I'm going to have to admit right from the start that this is the area of work which is least to find. I'm doing some work with both Katina and Roba on aspects of co-design. However, one of the challenging issues in a complex adaptive system is that co-design itself can affect emergent phenomena. So, where, where are we? What is the location of the work? Well, if you've got a large scale social network, testing a proposed code update or a new feature is a challenging task. People, both online and in person, act and interact with one another in ways that are sometimes difficult for traditional algorithms to mod model or to replicate. People's behavior evolves and adapts over time. It can be different from one geography to the next, and it makes it very difficult to anticipate the ways in which an individual or an entire community might respond to even a small change in their environment. Um, what Facebook has done, and I'm gonna show a separation from what Facebook's done and what, what um, my group is looking at, is to develop something called the Web Enabled Simulation or, or WES. So WES is a method for bringing, building purportedly or hopefully realistic and large scale simulations of complex social networks. It has three aspects. Firstly, using machine learning to train bots or agents to simulate the behaviors of real people on a real social media platform. They're trained to interact with each other using the same infrastructure as real users. So they can send messages to other bots or agents, comment on bots, posts or publish their own, or make friend requests to other bots. The way that Facebook operates, it limits the interaction so bots can engage with bots, but they can't engage with real users. And it gets to be pretty important to make sure that uh, bot behavior doesn't have impact on real users or their experiences of the platform. Again, you come down to two motivations, commercial ones and reputational ones. Nice thing about the WES is that it's able to automate interactions between millions of bots. It uses a combination of online and offline simulation. 
and train bots with anything from simple rules and supervised machine learning to more sophisticated reinforcement learning. This is designed to provide some simulation characteristics uh, which allow for uh, an effective training environment. The important thing for, for Facebook is that these bots are actually on production code base. That is, they can interact with each other on an actual Facebook platform, whether it's Facebook, Facebook or Meta Instagram. The idea is that real infrastructure simulation means that the outcomes and actions of the bots or agents are faithful to what would happen uh, if they were real people on a real platform. The idea is that you end up with a, uh, an environment which can explore complicated scenarios on a simple simulation. It's research only, but it's designed to improve services and identify potential reliability or integrity issues before they affect real people. So with this WES, Meta is doing both counterfactual and what if experiments. Essentially, it's avoiding doing AB experiments on real people. Facebook has used this WES to build what it calls Dub Dub. So the name Dub Dub or WW is meant to show it's a smaller version of the World Wide Web or Dub Dub Dub. But I think if you're a fan of Westworld, you'll know the real derivation of Dub Dub. With Dub Dub, the idea is that Meta can create. Uh, realistic AI bots that can do things that they're not allowed to do on a real platform. Because the bot is operating on an actual production version of Facebook, it can conduct searches, do all of the things the real person might, but without interacting with real people. The problem, the problem for me is that the research, there's a research challenge and that's created from the whole of the Facebook approach. Essentially, each of the agents or bots falls into one of or more of the four categories set out in the slide. The problem is that a real rules-based bot is likely to be the most common because you're likely to use that as the basis of this is what a person is. But as I'm, I'll come to in a moment, the real problem with uh, a rules-based bot is trying to determine what rules should apply. Okay, so now I'm gonna to move to complexity and emergence. What you're looking at at the moment is an output of a simulation which was developed way, way back in 1986 by Craig Reynolds, and it's called Boyds. It simulates the flocking behavior of birds. It's a really useful way of seeing the potential for emergent effects flowing from the action of boundedly rational agents in a complex system. As you watch, you can see flocks emerging and the ones on the left have just merged. They've started from a random position and they've gone through to provide what are clearly flocks and what are clearly merging flocks. Now, there are only actually three rules that apply for each agent. And this is getting to the heart of what is boundedly rational. So the first rule is a separation rule. So if you're a Boyd and you're an agent in this simulation, you steer to avoid bumping into flock mates. So you don't bump in to other agents. The next rule is an alignment rule. What you really want to do is head in the same direction as your flock mates. So 
if uh, this is a bit like a, a, a rule that you might see in ducks flying well, in Australia north for the winter, in the US flying south for the winter, a rule that says you head towards the average heading of the flock mates near you. And finally, a cohesion rule. What you're trying to do is steer towards the average position or centre of mass of local flock mates. But that's it. Those are the only three rules which take uh, a system from randomness, uh, sometimes used cha called chaos, and indeed I'll call it chaos a bit later on, to an environment where you can actually see the emergence of phenomena and the adaptation of flocks from one single flock to the merge, the merger of flocks. Okay, so I think I probably need to run through some of the nomenclature for complexity. So a complex adaptive system, abbreviated to CAS, is a collection of agents. That system exhibits complex behaviour, it adapts to changing environments. The system is the outcome is of a large number of decisions made every moment by a diverse group of boundedly rational agents. It has another phenomenon which is quite important, which is a bit like quantum mechanics. How do you observe the system if the observation actually forms part of the system? And that's a, a problem that uh, becomes an issue if you are trying to build an adaptive system model. And we can look at some of the issues which arise in creating a model that reflects a complex adaptive system. Essentially, there are three uh, characteristics, each of which creates particular effects. The first is nonlinearity. It's the essence of a complex adaptive system. So because the system itself is nonlinear, issues such as starting conditions become critical to the process of emergence. Second is emergence itself. This emergence can be characterized as either adaptation, evolution or transformation. And we saw both evolution and adaptation in the Boyd simulation that I showed. The final issue is the state. Most complex adaptive systems are terribly boring. That is, they're either in a state of order or a state of chaos. So state of chaos, it all looks random. State of order, there's nothing much going on. And in either of those states, they're highly predictable and not terribly interesting. What becomes interesting is when there's an emergence of patterns or where there appears to be self-organisation. Okay, one of the issues that arises with the Facebook digital twin from an academic perspective is that the twin itself is proprietary. That is, if I published a research paper based on Facebook's digital twin, none of you are going to be able to replicate it unless you have access to that proprietary network. And so one of the approaches that we're proposing to take is to use other social networks and there are a number of open source social networks including diaspora elg hum hub which is our favorite at the moment and boot camp and you can use those um, on uh, a docker based platform and from an academic perspective again that's really great because we can probably use aws's uh, academic support in order to host that uh, docker one of the other issues is that you have to be able to characterize those 
uh, agents as good or bad, which means that you actually run into genuine um, ethics issues if you have people and bots sharing the same network, because the, you can end up with more than negligible risk occurring to the people. So I'm going to now move to the heart of the problem. So what we're trying to do is to model and predict um, emergent phenomenon. We're making the assumption, which I think is not unreasonable, that a social network is an online social network is a, a complex adaptive system, it's certainly a multi agent model. And so there's a potential for emergence. The problem is that the agents or bots that we're modeling are people. One of the critical issues is how do you get to the tipping point which characterizes the interesting bit of a complex adaptive system, that bit at the edge of order and chaos. And the fundamental problem with models that don't appropriately reflect the banded rationality of people is that emergent phenomena may appear in the model that don't appear in practice. Um, in some environments, the mere fact that emergent phenomena can appear is an end in itself. That's a great research outcome for many projects. But that's not the case if we're trying to model real life. And multi-agent models usually do something to assign, assign a statistical likelihood of the response to an input. I'm going to engage in heresy here. Uh, I'm going to say it doesn't matter whether that statistical approach is frequentist or Bayesian. The effect is that the agent is expected to respond with a limited range of outputs to a given input. That is, the multi-agent based model assumes that agents will use a judgment heuristic in order to determine the response to an input. In people, heuristics are cognitive shortcuts, and we use them most of the time as an alternative to making an informed rational choice, especially when there are many options available. The modeling issue is, that arises is that humans instinctively choose the heuristic use to use based on their experience of the use of heuristics in a given context. Judgment heuristics include representativeness, availability, adjustment and anchoring, affect, and risk and loss aversion. The outputs of the heuristic are subject to biases, including substitution bias and if excessive coherence. That is, the human decisional judgment is likely to be the subject of bias, which is more easily modeled, and noise. And noise can be modeled by the choice of a frequentist model, but a Bayesian model risks uh, uh, avoids the risk of confusing noise with variations in the data. That is, a Bayesian approach can avoid overfitting. The frequentist approach usually assumes noise is white, that is, noise is Gaussian, but you nor I nor other humans don't have uniform power spectral density. And there's a further complication. And this is it, that sometimes, perhaps only in respect of 2% of decisions, humans make, more, make decisions by thinking more deeply and don't use a heuristic at all. And this is a more complicated issue. Having a 98% accurate model may miss all of the emergent phenomena or may model an emergent phenomena that doesn't occur with real people. It's important to note that bad actors and good actors share the same heuristic approaches, but their choice of heuristic will be determined by their motive. Moreover, and to add to the complication, bad actors use strategies to nudge users into employing heuristics, which lead to poor outcomes for the good user. And this could also lead to a potential form of emergence. 
This occurs when good actors choose poor heuristics and create the same outcomes as those intended by bad actors. That is, they break the community rules. The aim of the work that we're doing is to improve modeling techniques in complex multi-agent emergent systems. And so what we're looking at is two research questions. The primary one is how do we predict users' behaviors when those users apply heuristics as well as deep thinking? And the second one is how do we predict community behaviors when a community consists of members that apply heuristics and deep thinking, but with a de degree of commonality that flows from membership in that community. And the way we're going to do this is looking at two separate approaches. I mentioned we're transdisciplinary. We've got a, a psychologist, a psychologist who's also a linguist uh, <coughs> and a me. And the psychologists and linguists are looking specifically uh, in how do you assess the likelihood of any specific, not just general a heuristic, but a specific heuristic by users in response to a particular input. And my part is looking at the degree of sophistication that a bot is required to have to reasonably predict emergent phenomena in a cyber cyber world. And that's difficult because there's a frugal level of bounded rationality that is required for emergence. And I mentioned that the co-design part is the hardest part. Um, and why is that? <clears throat> well, co-design is necessarily transdisciplinary. But in your looking at a heuristic, you're going to get issues where heuristics, which are commonly used in one discipline, could be a core problem statement in another. So what I think is, oh, yes, this is, uh, yeah, I do it that way pretty much all of the time, could be, for example, a core pro problem to an architect in, a, an environment, in the built environment school. The second issue is one of, how do you ensure that the co-design itself doesn't miss either the relevant heuristics or the deep, uh, deeper thinking? And the problem here, particularly if you had a, a public participation in co-design, is that you give people, tell people, well, Actually, you don't think deeply 98% of the time. When do you think deeply? And the immediate response, well, if I'm in the focus group, I think deeply about everything. I don't, uh, I don't make things up. I don't use uh, heuristics. I'm, I'm a, a, a deep thinker and I apply deep thought to each problem. The issue that comes from this, whether it's public partic participation or other forms of transdisciplinary participation, is how do you ensure that the participation in co-design doesn't lead you down a design path that has agents not using heuristics in an environment where they would normally use heuristics and using heuristics when they would normally deep think. Now, the, the, the graphic that I've got up on the uh, slide at the moment is how the uh, International Association for Public Participation looks at the spectrum of co-design. It's really quite difficult to see how that might work in this particular project, but I'm not sure that co-design, that not co-designing um, wouldn't foreclose the likely identification of emergent phenomenon. In particular, one of the issues that I think co-design is likely to be able to help identify is what is good and what is bad, because my uh, uh, assumptions as to 
what is good conduct or what is bad conduct, what is misinformation and what is the truth might differ from other people who are involved in the co-design process for agents. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Rob, for that very interesting and thought-provoking talk, and I'm sure there are many questions, but I will hand over to Martin to moderate our Q&A session and uh, provide him with the opportunity for some reflections. Uh, thank you very much, Roba, and thank you very much, Pat and Rob, for your amazing presentations. Uh, before uh, sharing some thoughts, uh, I want to like look uh, if there's somebody in the audience have any questions already, you can also use the chat if you wish to post your questions as well. Um, you can like uh, raise your hand in the reaction section. Uh, but meanwhile, to, to like kickstart this part of this conversation, uh, I really appreciate how these two presentations come uh, from two different places, but like uh, align uh, about different ways to understand technologies. Uh, one about narratives and their understanding of technology and the other to like reflect about uh, these complex systems and the heuristics that uh, are behind there uh, in the case of little twins and how we can work with them. Um, but I would love to uh, highlight the transdisciplinary aspect of both presentations. And I would like to ask both, which one um, elements do you think uh, from your different expertises, uh, you will engage with other communities or with other members because both are, are, are uh, really interesting works that like for sure you are like working with collaborators and like elaborating with partners or with communities that help you to like understand this narrative and unfold these dichotomies in one case and the other to like explore these complex after systems and, uh, and your work. Uh, Rob? If you want to start? Sure, thanks. I, I think one of the, so the, I'll label some of the disciplines in the, the transdisciplinary approach. So um, I'm in the business school, my focus is on regulation and governance. Um, my uh, co researchers, one is a cyber psychologist, one is uh, a, a linguist and a psychologist. And the underlying platforms that we're looking at, essentially, we're working with uh, computer scientists in order to actually build what we're what we're going to to do our experiments on. And one of the most critical things, I think, in taking that transdisciplinary approach is not trying to uh, to work in a way that says well, this project is a governance project, or this is a psychology project, actually bringing together all the fields in a way that says everybody has something valuable to contribute. And indeed, I, I need you. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't do an uh, analysis of heuristics because I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I can use your analysis of heuristics to help to write some uh, meta code in order for somebody else to build a bot that has taken the, that into account. So it's actually working across multiple disciplines in a way that says everybody's got something to contribute in a way that tries, and I think one of the important things is all of the researchers in the project have got this same view, which is nobody's more important than another we're all in a position where we can make a, a, a contribution to the project in a way that will lead to a, the most fruitful outcome. Uh, we have a question from Roba now. Thanks, Martin. Um, I just found it really interesting what you mentioned, Rob, and just some practical guidance around how to engage with potential collaborators from multiple disciplines. On that note, um, I think something that's quite interesting that both you and um, uh, Patrick mentioned around complex systems, in your case, complex ad adaptive systems. Pat referenced the work of Perot, so normal accident theory, how these systems are tightly coupled and they lead to systems fragility. 
Um, and, and that's partly, um, I guess that's part of the complexity, part of what we're trying to deal with here. I think um, something that's worth um, elaborating on, and I would love to hear your perspectives on, in multi and transdiscipline research in particular, what suggestions would you have about conveying complexity to diverse stakeholders? So the complexity that you spoke about, who might not necessarily agree about a particular view of the system. So you were talking more about sort of engagement, interaction, respecting others' opinions and things like that, and everyone having something valid to put forward to the table. But do you feel a necessary starting point would be to agree about the system itself, what the system constitutes, um, particularly when you're talking about ideas of good and bad and, and other things that you and I and, and our, our team have spoken about, but what suggestions would you have about conveying complexity more specifically? I liked your analogy about emergence with the, um, with the birds and, and um, the rules around that. Is there a similar process you would recommend for conveying system complexity in a trans or um, in multidisciplinary setting? I think actually one of the most important things is allowing people to understand what's going on in a complex system in their own way. So for me, um, one of the aspects of complexity is, well, if, if you're looking at a, a social network, um, the complexity, we can look at points in time, essentially each snapshot looks like a graph, um, a mathematical graph, so you can apply graph theory to see what are the edges, what, uh, what are the nodes at each point in time. Um, the psychologists that I'm working with don't think about that at all, they think about it as people. Um, so that what is that person thinking about at a point in time? Who are they interacting with? So for me, at least, one of the ways of trying to make transdisciplinary projects work is not to say you have to think about this in a particular framework, that in effect, each lens is as valid as any other lens, um, as long as we have a common language um, that we can talk about, which is, why did I have a slide talking, which had the nomenclature of complex adaptive systems? <clears throat> well, broadly, because um, this is how I understand complex adaptive systems. And that slide, because it's been used before, was to help me to relate to uh, the psychologist. This is, this is the lens that I'm coming from. Their lens was completely different. You know, it's people and society and social groups and uh, individuals and not nodes and edges because people aren't nodes, uh, people are people. So it's actually having a common language but not using that common language to require that language to be used to, as a lens or a frame. So you can actually get don't don't do things that tie down and say we're a transdisciplinary team but we're going to be using graph theory all the way through or um but look at different approaches and, and indeed um when you start to look at sharing that type of nomenclature so in um in looking at games and hypergames or graphs and hypergraphs, um, you're starting to say, well, here is uh, one way of looking at things. But the there are analogies in other disciplines and those analogies in those other disciplines, actually being open enough to say, ah, yes, that, I call that a hypergraph and yeah, you call it a community. That's fine. Um, as long as we end up with the, uh, enough of a common language that we can talk to each other. Yeah, I think those are some um, really great points, Rob, um, particularly around the common language. So what I took away from that was that um, there is a requirement for these multiple perspectives on the system or multiple views of the system that sort of um, converge at that language, um, I guess, establishment process. It would appear that there needs to be some kind of mapping or translation exercise across disciplines. And I think to point out really early on that that's a time consuming process. I know some projects that I've been involved in, it's taken at least two to three years to have that mapping occur in a way that then 
what we call a, a multidisciplinary, we haven't even um, uh, called it transdisciplinary, in which, uh, at which point uh, a multi or interdisciplinary methodology emerges. Um, so I think persistence is key here and also the open, uh, being open to sharing um, those differences and having those difficult discussions where some tensions might exist might be the key to some of this transdisciplinary, um, uh, I guess, uh, work. Uh, thanks so much for answering the question. And we have a next question for uh, Marik. I hope I know. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, and many thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I have a question about the heuristics that you mentioned. So you basically said there's always this um, problem to kind of find out whether people are working on heuristics or engage in deep thinking. Um, but I have, have a hard time imagining what these kinds of heuristics are that you work with and how you empirically uh, detect them in the first place because i would assume that you do a lot of online research to find out what these heuristics are that people use on these social media platforms so maybe you can tell us more about the kind of research you do on heuristics and give us some examples of those heuristics thank you okay thanks very much for the question i think one of the the key issues is that the there has been a lot of work in, in psychology that has identified a range of heuristics that people use in their everyday lives. So the, the issue is less um, identifying what are the possible heuristics, it's to do with what are the heuristics that are actually used. And many of these come from repetition. Um, and I'm going to try and give you an example. It's, it's a bit hard because it's a very Australian example, but there's a, uh, an independent politician who is a, a, an anti-vax person. And there are a group of people who follow him on Facebook um, <clears throat> until he was banned from Facebook, like some other politicians in, in the US, um, who inevitably, when whatever post he put up, would either like or repost that, uh, that post. So essentially being part of a community, and in this case, a community of um, less anti-vaxxers than people who feel that their freedom is being curtailed by the requirement to have a vaccination. So they, they were following a heuristic and the heuristic was pretty simple. If his name's Craig Kelly. If Craig Kelly says something, the response is like. But that changed. And it changed because the same politicians started to uh, send out text messages um, in a way that looked like text spam. And the real problem was that uh, most of those text messages were sent, sent out on Sunday morning. So you have a group of people who are concerned about freedoms who suddenly, actually in church on a Sunday morning, find that their phone's going off and it's Craig Kelly uh, trying to contact them to encourage them to, to join his political party. That change created a shift. So this is an example. It's a shift from heuristics, it's Craig, to well, this is the guy who texts me during church. Um, and the, the processes changed in response to the particular approach that was taken by the politician. And that's a very small example, but this is, uh, a, is a real example of how, if you've been using a, a bot that had had Reinforce, using reinforcement machine learning, essentially it would be really hard to say, well, when does it change from to, oh, this is the guy who disturbs me, because the answer is probably never in the model. So it's actually how I've got a range of heuristics that have been well des described in the psychological literature. But the issue is, when do people stop using those heuristics? And it's, there is some, uh, there's a reasonable amount of psychological literature as to when that happens, but it's ultimately linked to, when does the heuristic lead to an outcome with which I am not happy? Um, so once you've got to that, how do you then model that 
in uh, an agent to say certain sets of input conditions create unhappiness or stop an immediate heuristic response and therefore at that point there is a deep thought response um so i hope i've answered the question it's probably not a, a great example on a uh, on an international call but it's uh, it's an example of how that might work uh, really thanks rob for the answer uh, I'm also invite again if like somebody else have another question. We have like two or ten minutes before the end of the session. Um, I, I would like to uh, build up with this notion of like uh, a risk uh, uh, Marie game, um, but also connect a little bit the two conversations, the presentation of Pat and yours, bro. Uh, because something that for me was interesting in your case is like how you're like trying to um, in the process of co-design. You have different questions and one that like stick with me was like this good and bad um uses of the digital twins but but also like have a different approach to this good and bad and i want to combine a little uh, and and he uh, talk about like how different communities have like different kind of like positions and like the, the question is like for if, if the thing is good or bad if for who is good and bad i would like to um but you, should, like, you can reflect a little on the, the case study you're uh, doing with the digital twins and with uh, the heuristics about this decision making for he uh, for who these kind of like transformations and co design process are good and bad in your opinion i suppose it, <laughs> the answer is of course it depends but the the reality so i'll go back to do, doing two things one one is there is a bad one approach to bad actors is to say bad actors or bad agents are agents that want to promulgate uh, incorrect information, disinformation or misinformation. Now that's that's problematic um, it, to to begin with. But in so you end up in two different parts. One is well, what do you mean by disinformation in the real world? And it's what I consider to be disinformation because I know what the truth is. And that's not very helpful to, well, actually, perhaps we don't, in a, a model, we, we don't really care as long as we take the view that some information is, and some actors are acting bad, in a bad way, and other people are good or benign actors or good or benign agents so what we're really interested in is if we create an agent that we label bad um, and they are trying to spread what our system says is disinformation what are the effects what are the emergent uh, phenomena associated with that it becomes more difficult in in the real world. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll use Pat's uh, discussion earlier on. So, if in I don't know, January the sixth, twenty twenty, what comes out of sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue is that the truth or is that disinformation? Uh, it becomes really hard in the real world to draw these distinctions. But in a model, at least, you can start to say, I will label that agent as, or that bot as a, as a bad bot. And the, the information that that bad bot is trying to disseminate is misinformation or disinformation. So this is where the, is this going to be useful research? Is it going to have a great impact? And, is it a, a, a nice little model created by academics in a, 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 a non-real environment? This is one of the, the places where those two collide with each other. Thanks. Um, we have time for just one question. I want to be sure that Sambi, Jason, Brian, Katina, Melissa, you want any question? Because it seems that Rob have another question. Jump in. Uh, Rob, good to see you again. Um, just sort of based on a, a bit of the misinformation, I saw a recent article, I think, from you and another colleague, you're talking about AI and privacy. 
And you were saying that sort of what we needed there was that decision support system, and that just happens to be a human. So um, my challenge to my students is how, how do they know as a human to make that decision about the deep fakes, the misinformation, when technology is just too good, it's too convincing. Uh, what can we do about that? And, and that's that's really problematic. Um, so the in the uh, the approach on privacy, but in general, applying technology to to regulatory decisions, um, whether it's reg tech from the regulator's perspective or reg tech from the perspective of the regulator, using that technology as a decision support tool is important. So how do you deal with uh, deep fakes? Well, if you can use any form of machine learning that's going to say, this looks like it's a deep fake rather than, um, rather than real, in order to provide a decision support tool, that's a really important thing. So the human actually uses as much technology as, as is available to draw those distinctions. On the other hand, um, it would have taken a little while, but I promise you I'm real, but you can't be certain of that. Real provoking answer, uh, Rob. Uh, we're in the last minute. Uh, I appreciate Rob's uh, engagement with us during all this Q&A. was a little, little more uh, longer than like, he expected because uh, we had the other uh, technical issue. But like the session, the session is uh, about to end. I want to hand to Rova for final words. Thank you so much, Martin, for that excellent moderation. Um, and Rob, for answering all our questions. And there were many more questions, as you saw there, that we hope to pick up on perhaps offline. And that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, to Patrick Scannell and Associate Professor Rob Nichols for sharing their research and their insights. Also, a big thank you to our live attendees for joining us today, for your questions, um, and for being here with us today. Um, I think there are so many interesting points that we can delve into beyond this session. I found the interplay between the good and bad aspects of technology something that warrants discussion beyond an hour and a half, particularly when we're talking about who or what to blame and whether we, as Pat said, veer towards something that focuses on, um, on claiming back that control as a society. But I think it's going to be quite tricky to determine how we do this. Uh, certainly the work of Pat in that area and some of the solutions he suggested uh, stepping in the right direction. Rob's work on co-design and so much more. I look forward to following that work, Rob, to see how we can translate that into, um, into other contexts. So that'll be fantastic. A big thank you to, um, to the ASU uh, support Melissa Waite, Anna Reed, and also Cindy Dick today. And thank you to you all and have a lovely day. Thank you.